Well, welcome everyone to our first of our Mindful Communication Superpowers webinars. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you today. And especially with all the people who took the quiz, whether you're a, a deer or a, an eagle or a lion or a horse or a cheetah, I want to say that you're you know, you're in the right place. We're going to talk about your communication superpower in these webinars. And, um, and let us know in the comments section. Let us know what animal you are, if you took the quiz, uh, what profession you're in, and uh, also where you're at. We're curious where people are tuning in from. So um, I want to say we're going to, we're going to celebrate our own superpower in these webinars, we're also going to explore the other superpowers to delve into the areas that maybe we're, we're not as familiar with or we're not as natural in our abilities with. So, uh, I, and I also want to remind you, as I did in the, in the assessment videos, that you're not just one. You're a mix. So we don't have to be too um, particularly tuned in to one. We can expand out and we can learn we can learn the others as well. So uh, I am I, obviously I'm Greg Heffron. I'm the executive director of the Green Zone Institute for Mindful Communication, and um, I've been helping others understand these superpowers for 11 years now. Uh, this is the first in a series of these three videos, and we're going to learn how to together learn how to assess communication on the fly with your clients and uh, utilize these superpowers to attune more effortlessly and also manage and uh, course correct when, when disattunement arises. So I wanted to start out by saying that when I started practicing mindfulness in the late 90s, uh, I, I had a particular psychological relational focus. Intimacy, community, this was my focus coming into the idea of being present. And uh, I, was, I was married to a therapist, uh, had very, very close immediate friends who were therapists. I was kind of surrounded by this group, many of whom were meditators as well. And uh, we, would, we would sit around the dinner table having conversations about object relations theory. And, you know, uh, I, I remember particularly sitting in the kitchen and somebody making diagrams on a whiteboard about, you know, the Jungian idea of self with a big S versus self with a small S. And I, honestly, I don't, I, don't, I don't even remember the details of these things. And I'm, I'm no expert on those things. But what I, what I want to say about this is being surrounded by this very tight-knit community of helping professionals. And, and myself, I was a helping professional as well. And what I, what I noticed is how much we all struggled when it came to uh, connection and disconnection, and particularly in our professional lives, the kind of, the kind of anguish of, of making a relationship and tuning that relationship and, and being able to, to find someone and really lean in. So uh, what I'm presenting today is actually something that I am an expert in. And, and I'm going to offer it to you so that you can use it in your professional life in a thousand different ways to, to connect with your clients. So I'm presenting all this from a mindfulness perspective. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's funny, actually, I happened upon a Psychology Today article that was, the title was, Has Mindfulness Become the New Kale? And uh, that cracked me up. I thought that was, that was funny, you know, because there's some sense of mindfulness being overhyped or oversold. You know, I'd say we're what? How, how far are we into this mindfulness trend? 10 years, 15 years now. 
And I remember going to the grocery store in Los Angeles, just a very average grocery store. And there was something like four different magazines that had mindfulness on the cover in, in the checkout at the grocery store. But I wanted to say, on the one hand, that's true. It's, you know, the sort of the trendy aspect is definitely uh, going on. But it's when we think about what mindfulness is, it's just clear and accurate attention to real-time experience, right? It's, it's, you say, well, it's, it's what's happening in the now? But what's happening in the now is, you, we could simplify that. That even sounds too fancy. We could just say, what's happening? Paying attention to what's happening. So this being oversold or overhyped actually boils down to it just being described in an unrealistic way. You know, it's, it's, it's not being accurately portrayed. And it's, in a way, it's a lot simpler than that. So, you know, whether you're a therapist or a coach or a mindfulness trainer or whatever your profession is, you work with your clients to, to allow things to become conscious. You know, that's how we gain agency is by becoming conscious of opportunities, patterns, you know, tendencies, um, emotions, thoughts, our bodies. And so you could say, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to point out things so that they come into consciousness. You could say that so that they come into mindfulness. That's actually the, that's actually the same notion. And, um, I think all of you know that something like this is not a quick fix. It's not something that could be rigidly enforced or, you know, scold, you can't scold somebody into consciousness, actually. It, it has the opposite effect, as, as you know. So um, this is a learning process about how to create a, a positive relationship with ourselves and to appreciate ourselves, you could say. How to settle into core experience and become mindful, become conscious. And, and even when it comes to correcting harmful behaviors or patterns, we actually have to settle in in order to become conscious of those patterns and then gain the agency to begin to steer and steer away from those patterns, get ourselves out of those situations. So um, this is not a cold or a clinical process. Mindfulness is not, it's not austere. It's actually, uh, it needs warmth, kindness, patience, and uh, discipline, because it's not a quick fix. You don't snap your fingers. It's a learning process. Now, I didn't always know about these superpowers or about mindful communication. I first heard about it directly from my mentor, Susan Gillis Chapman. And uh, she's a author uh, of The Five Keys to Mindful Communication. She's a retired therapist and a, and a senior Buddhist teacher. And uh, in, in 2009, we were walking around a lake near her house, Deer Lake in uh, Burnaby, British Columbia. And it's a very beautiful little lake in the middle of a city. You're in the middle of a city, but you can't see the city. You just see the trees and the mountains. It's quite lovely. And she started to explain some of the most basic material, which is what I will be presenting today. And it was, it was like a bolt of lightning went through me. I felt immediately the, the, the truth of what she was presenting, and I felt immediately that it was applicable, that I could start to apply it straight away. And uh, this was um, an experience I'll never forget. As we walked around the lake and she explained more of what she was presenting, 
I, I gathered a real sense that I wanted to know everything about this. And by the time we walked around the lake, she said, come, come look, there's this very beautiful house and, uh, that's by Canada's most famous architect. And I'd like to rent it and start offering workshops on this. And by the time we got to the house, we'd already decided to, to put on a workshop. And she, she wanted me to come in to present ex direct experiential exercises out of uh, another tradition I teach called Mudra Space Awareness, a kind of mind-body meditation practice. And, uh, and, and that's how we began years ago. And uh, those, those workshops were quite incredible. I was so grateful to be there learning directly from Susan, directly from the kind of vision holder of this material. And over a few dozen workshops, I began to teach more and more of, the, of her material. And then I began teaching on my own. <clears throat> so what's interesting to me though, and I think this is relevant to you, is that even as I was learning this, I was looking at my own struggles. And, uh, you know, I, I had been a teaching Buddhist classes and I had been a kind of meditation coach. And, you know, I also had my professional life and professional relationships and the difficulties with that at times. I'd, I'd actually recently come out of a painful marriage where, you know, we were very, very close. There's no question about that. We were extremely close. But as is true in so many relationships, we couldn't consistently work through our issues that came up. And, uh, you know, again, this is, she was a therapist. I was a Buddhist teacher. We were surrounded by all these friends with lots of training and, you know, theoretical understanding, but still, but still we really struggled. And I, I think of that a lot. I think of how much we struggled. And then when I, when I met Susan and I discovered mindful communication, I began to understand the emotional mechanisms that disconnect communication. I began to see what could be done to reconnect. And, you know, probably most importantly, what do you do when there's no connection? In the moments when there's no connection and you can't reconnect, what do you do then? You know, it's, uh, I looked back on that relationship. I looked back on many relationships and situations in my life and things began to fall into place. So I aspired at that point to try to convey this method to others so that, so that they did not have to go through what I went through. All right. Um, so the goal of this webinar series is to point out these critical aspects so that you could feel grounded and oriented in real time in complex changing states of connection and disconnection with your clients and, and with anybody in your life for that matter. And then especially how to work with your own fear, alarm, self-doubt, that's very important. That's a critical part of this process. And then to gain confidence, to learn how to trust yourself that you actually do know how to guide yourself through these situations. And from the perspective of this material, that is actually built into each and every one of us. It's a very good news. So uh, let's get into uh, what I learned and what I want to share with you today. And th this is, you know, this is really, this is how you can, we really want to focus on how you can maintain a more consistent, strong connection with yourself. 
in the midst of all of the life's chaos, interpersonal chaos. And uh, so that you can maintain that, that kind, relaxed, strong, mindful connection in, in various situations. And, you know, that's, that's emotional intuition. We talked about intuition in the description of this program. And it really is. It's an intuitive, it's an intuitive method rather than just a theoretical method. It's, it's helping you get back in touch with your intuition. So let's, let's dig in, shall we? Uh, in this first video, we're going we're gonna to focus on that self-connection. And we're going to begin to look at how to assess communication states on the fly. <clears throat> so I'm going to share my screen here with you all. And, well, I was going to share my screen with you all, but my button is not working. Hmm. Curious. Okay, well, I think we're going to do this without the slides then. So, um, so let's talk about the idea of communication being natural. And this is really something that I think is the most exciting and encouraging aspect is the idea that communication is something that you are built to do. And actually, you know, this is kind of ironic, right? Because you're a highly trained group. You're professionals who use communication professionally. And uh, the irony of this this way of looking at communication is that it's actually, you were born with it. You were born with communication. And uh, it, it actually, in some ways, this is almost an untraining process, coming back to that natural state. And you can think of children. You can think of young children and that kind of openness, that, that kind of open gaze and that immediacy. Why, why do people, you know, why are we drawn to children? I was just watching a video, a YouTube video last night about a, a father and an infant having a conversation about taking a bath and the infant did not want to take the bath. And it was one of those YouTube videos that a zillion people watched and liked. And why is it so compelling is because children know how to be incredibly immediate. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, limitations on being a kid. Let's not, you know, let's not whitewash it. But there is something so enlivening about children because they're right there with you. And, you know, as people say all the time, they don't miss anything. They're, they're, they're watching what's going on. They ask the question. They ask the question nobody asks. And in that way, communication, the channel of communication is open. And then often we, we train ourselves away from that natural state. So let's, let's talk about the natural state. So we're going to talk about this, and we're going to call this the natural communication system. And there's three aspects to this. So aspect number one, we call awake body. So awake body, what does this mean? Awake body means your senses. So from a mindfulness perspective, we're talking about somatic experience that you're seeing your hearing, your feeling, touch feeling. You know, there's, there's uh, your nose, your mouth, all these things. We have, we have these um, capacities. Let's call them capacities. These fields of experience. And each one is a whole huge rich aspect of what's going on in the present moment. You know, when you look out through your eyes, are you seeing what happened five minutes ago? 
when you listen through your ears, are you actually literally hearing something that's not happening? No, you're, you're hearing what's happening now. Now we can tune out that information. We can tune out those capacities. We can overwrite them with you know, mental experience. But in mindfulness, we learn how to relax and realize this body is awake all the time. Uh, maybe not when you're asleep, literally, but when you're, when you're upright, when you're doing your thing, then the body is delivering us information continuously. So that's awake body. And then tender heart. So this, this idea that your emotions, and again, for many of you, you do this professionally, but your emotions are a source of information. You are responding in real time to what's occurring. And those responses tell you things. It's like having another sense. So emotions can cause trouble at times, as, as again, as, as you know professionally. And yet emotions at their root, if understood properly, are actually just connected in with the present moment and allow you to see what you might not have seen otherwise. And then we have the open mind, the third aspect of our natural communication system. And this is, this is the, the best quality of the mind, the ability of the mind to be open, curious, to wonder about things, to actually explore, to, to take in a theory, let's say, take in, you know, whatever, object relations theory. And try it out, compare it with experience, see what it reveals, uh, set that down, pick up a different theory, try that out, see if that's helpful, see if that reveals anything. And the open mind actually stays open so it doesn't become fixated on just one approach. The open mind actually is flexible and fluid and is always updating. It's, uh, you know, you can think of the opposite of that as a frozen mind, right? But here we're talking about the open mind. So, um, about this theoretically, let's explore this experientially. So we're going to do a style of meditation that is uh, maybe similar to what you've done, or maybe it's different. And I'd say, you know, give it a try. See what, it, see what it's like. So, <clears throat> so this will be really simple. If you haven't meditated before, don't panic. There's, there's nothing too fancy going on here. And uh, mindfulness, again, is just, it's just being ourself in real time. So there's nothing particularly uh, outrageous about it. This is very normal. So our recommendation is actually to sit upright. So if you're, you know, if you're laying on your bed or something, <clears throat> find a comfortable upright posture where, you're, where your back is straight. It doesn't have to be rigid, but just upright. You know, get your, get your head balanced on your neck so that you can relax your back muscles a little bit. And, you know, you can put your hands anywhere you'd like. Just put them on your thighs. And here we, we just begin to slow down a little bit and settle. And what we're going to do is we're going to explore this natural communication system together. So uh, actually for this meditation, let's have our eyes open. We'll just have our eyes down. 
So you don't have to look right at the computer right now. You could even set the computer down or phone down and just listen. So let's begin to tune in to awake body. And after we do this, we'll talk about why it's called a communication system. So let's tune in to awake body, and we'll begin with touch. So feel touch in your body. We're listening for the signals of touch. Touch is giving us hundreds and hundreds of little signals. And with mindfulness, instead of just tuning into one signal, let's say, you know, the pain in your neck or something, we actually want to include more. We want to open up. Expand our attention. So you could feel your skin all over your body. Some of the skin is exposed and there's a tickle of air. Maybe that air is cool or maybe it's warm, but there's that slight sensation of movement of air. And then there's the feeling of your clothing. That soft press of the clothing. And, you know, there's the skin on your feet and the back of your neck, your face, stomach, your hands. And this is the outside of the body. But let's let's go deeper. There's the feeling of our muscles, and our tissues, it's the feeling inside your torso, around your heart, stomach, around your spine. feeling of your head, inside. What does the inside of the head feel like right at this present moment? And then there's the feeling of the bones. And of course, you can't feel everything. But there's something. There's some sense feeling the bones. This body has structure. And we feel that. And now, let's bring in another sense. Let's bring in hearing. So you hear the sound of my voice, but you're also hearing other things. You 
Maybe it's the hum of your computer. Maybe it's uh, traffic outside or the sound of your neighbors in the other apartment. Just realize that hearing is happening in the present moment. You're hearing what's happening now. Maybe there's even very, very quiet sounds. Sound of far away wind. And let's use our eyes too. So let's let our eyes actually just open to vision. What's right here, what's happening right now. And we can soften our idea that we have to make a story out of it. Just just look. Just just see. This is colors and shapes. Just for a moment let go of the idea that the eyes have to function to get you something. Just just let the eyes relax. Let them do what they're good at. And your vision isn't just at the center where the eyes are most focused. It's also around the outside. You have peripheral vision. Just soften into all of that. And you can include taste and smell if you'd like. So awake body. Is awake body staying the same or are you getting updates constantly? So now let's bring that same care and awareness to the heart. So this is tender heart. Now the heart is tender. There's a a sense of being vulnerable. When we tune into our emotions, we tuned into a interdependent matrix with our environment. We are responding. We are responding to what's happening inside. We're responding to what's happening outside. So just take a deep breath and let it out. Just And find that sensitivity. It may be very quiet today. Or you might be having strong emotions today. And we're just listening. It's as if you hooked into a radio station and you're not sure what's happening today. And there it is, it's playing. Could be dramatic, could be, you know, dull. 
could be funny. Just feel. Feel that signal. And lastly, let's connect with open mind. So again, this is the best of the mind. This is this mind's capacity to be interested, open, curious. And I want you to actually be curious about the mind itself. Look at the mind itself. What are the thoughts doing right now in the present? Are the thoughts rising up with uh, certain themes? Are there a lot of thoughts? Are there very few thoughts? Just look at those directly. You could have thoughts about looking at thoughts. And just relax. You you don't have to be tight about this. Just relax. To catch a few glimpses. All right, so let's bring all of that together. So... All the senses, awake body, touch, hearing, seeing, smell, taste. Just feel that awakeness of the body, all those signals coming in. And then that radio station of the heart, tender heart. What is the experience of the emotions in the present moment as they change and respond? And what is happening in the open mind? Just feel all of that together. Okay, so as we come out of that meditation, just let yourself feel that change as you come out and return to a more typical way of being. And uh, you can let us know in the comments what that was like for you. You know, if there was anything you noticed anything interesting that came up. And uh, I want to say that mindfulness is that simple. It's just tuning in. It's just learning how to settle and tune in. And um, yet, as many of us know from practicing mindfulness, it ain't so simple, right? It's, it's a little bit hard for us to slow down and tune in. And this very much has to do with, with having trained ourselves away from being ourselves. There's a kind of rejection that we, we've trained ourselves to reject our real experience. And, uh, you know, this could almost, it could almost be humorous, except it's actually kind of sad when you think about it. I mean, it is kind of funny. Like, what, what, why would we train ourselves not to be ourself? You know, there's an absurdity to it. But we also know it's very sad. It's very sad not to be ourselves. It's very sad not to connect with ourself. To appreciate, actually, how much capacity we do have. We have so much capacity right here. And um, we've just somehow 
allowed ourselves to become dissuaded from that connection. So, um, so on the one hand, that's sad. On the other hand, there's a celebration. So much is available right here. And I want to say that why we call this the natural communication system is because when I am connected right here, right where I live, so to speak, automatically, when I'm in my senses, when I'm plugged into my emotional experience, when I'm open to what's happening in my mind, automatically, I'm here in the room with somebody else. I'm automatically in the room with others. And, and I see clues. I'm getting information there. Somebody's speaking. I'm actually listening. I'm literally listening through my ears. I'm looking through my eyes to see their face. I'm hearing the moment when their voice cracks. And I look to see what's going on. I, I'm responding emotionally. At that moment, I get an emotional hit as the, somebody's voice cracks. You know, is something emotionally going on? Oh, no, or maybe their throat's dry. They're getting over a cold, whatever. Um, but, there's, but then there's curiosity. Actually, that's open mind. Was that because they're getting over their cold, or is it because of something they're touching on that's actually emotional? Huh, I wonder. Now that I think about it, open mind, now that I think about it, that situation with their, their mother just happened a month ago. Maybe it's really still in their experience. So again, this is, you know, this is something you do naturally. We do naturally. So of course you already know this <laughs> because it's natural. And of course everybody knows this, but, but we don't, right? We don't at the same time. So, um, so that's the training of mindfulness is to come back to this system that naturally connects us. And this is true with you, with your clients. You know, I think sometimes we feel like we have to achieve communication. And it's, and it's this tremendous learning process and we have to get more and more sophisticated. And if we're not sophisticated enough, we can't achieve it. And then we feel like we're failures sometimes because we're not achieving it. And God, I've got all this training. And uh, yet I'm not able to connect. And it's, there's a kind of relief to say, listen, there's a natural quality to this. And we can relax a bit, actually. It's so good, right? So, um, so let's, let's talk a little bit. That's about the self-connection. Now, we cannot connect with others if we're not plugged in here. It cannot happen. As soon as I disconnect, let's say I disconnect from my emotions, and I just go into my head, I'm in my body and my head, then it doesn't quite work, right? I mean, if I'm not receiving updates in my emotions, I'm missing a lot of what's going on. If I'm more in my emotions and my body, but I'm not using my mind to examine things, and like ask really good questions. I could get dragged along by emotional momentum. As, as well, you, you know, and you know, particularly working with clients, right? This can be very intense and painful. And, uh, you know, there's also, there's a layer of being kind of stuck in the body and not having access to the rest. It's a very kind of flat state and uh, lacks enthusiasm and enjoyment. It's just sort of going through the motions. 
So, so we really want all of this plugged in. We want all of it plugged in at the same time. And you say, oh, well, that's really hard to plug all that in at the same time. No, 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 no. We're born plugged in. We're born plugged in. We gradually pulled out our cables. We've, we've, we've been trained to do that. So let's, let's learn how to stop pulling out the cables. Let's get back to the way we are. Let's get back to who we are and uh, enjoy that process of, of making friends with ourselves. you could say. Uh, so now we need to get into the, um, the assessment aspect. I'm checking my button again to see if I can share my screen, and it's, it's definitely not going to let me. Oh, well, we'll just talk it through. So, um, so let's introduce a very, very simple metaphor. And this is the metaphor of the traffic light. So the, the advantage of this metaphor is that wherever you go, there seems to be traffic lights, for better and for worse, right? And uh, we've all been in traffic. And even if you don't drive, you've been in a taxi or something, right? You've been on a bus. And we, we understand the metaphor, right? So you've got the red light, the yellow light. In some places, it's orange. And the green light. Although in Japan, it's blue, I've heard. I haven't been to Japan. Right, but still, we have basically, we have three lights. And we use this... Uh-oh. Can you see me? Okay. Well, that was an interesting technical issue, mysterious technical issue. And uh, I hope at least some of you can see this uh, today, or maybe you're just looking at the recording later, uh, which is fine. So, so let's, let's continue. Let's, uh, let's keep going in the face of adversity. So this traffic light metaphor, the idea that traffic uh, flows when the light is green. So communication flows when we are in the state to be open to communication, when we are actually mindful of our natural communication system. That is the green light. So the green light and mindfulness are synonymous. The green light just means that we are mindful. And the red light is when it stops. So the red light is synonymous with being mindless. And mindless, it sounds like you have no mind. That's actually not what it means. Mindless means we've stopped paying attention to our basic faculties. We have disconnected those, we pulled out those plugs of our, our sensory experience, our heart, or our mind. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, from a clinical perspective, you could really talk about, I think quite accurately, you could talk about dissociation to lesser and greater degrees. And in some ways, it actually puts dissociation into a, into a very normal context that actually it's something, dissociation is something actually all of us do to greater and lesser degrees, right? So some people really dissociate very, very strongly. Others of us dissociate more mildly. In each case, the result is the same. I have a little bit left this room. I have a little bit left my body, or I've left my heart, or I've left my mind. I've boycotted them. And there are consequences for doing this. And I think that's, it, it's, there's a reason why this metaphor works, and it's because it's very, very simple. Very simple metaphor. So, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about how this process works. So when I am cut off from, let's say, my heart, I no longer receive the feedback that my heart would give me about the situation I'm in. 
So somebody says, um, and this is the red light. So the red light, I'm cut off. So somebody says, how are you doing? That was, that was an intense meeting we just had. How are you doing? And I say, I'm fine. Everything's fine. I'm 100% fine. Everything's just fine. Right? And it's because, and I actually, I actually feel that way, because there's a kind of anesthesia, right? Local, you could say local anesthesia. It's localized to my tender heart. And uh, in the same way, when I boycott my open mind, I might be having all sorts of emotional experiences. I might having, be having all sorts of bodily experiences. But I can't seem to think through things clearly. My mind becomes muddled. And uh, somebody says, well, you're, boy, you're still hanging around with uh, Jeff, huh? I say, yeah, yeah, I, I, Jeff is just an amazing guy. I really appreciate him. I think he's just incredible. And then somebody says, yeah, but didn't he sue you and, and took control of your business two years ago? You say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, there was stuff, but it's, you know, that's all in the past and everything's like, he's just so, we're just really connected. Right, so in this sense, then I'm, I'm not asking very, very basic and obvious questions, because I've dissociated a little bit from my open mind. <clears throat> and in the same way, of course, from my body. Right, if I'm not getting the bodily signals, what am I getting? You know, if I'm not seeing and hearing and feeling, literally. I'm, not, I'm literally not in the room. I'm literally not, I'm not getting the most basic information that would, you could build a relationship from. So that's the idea of when we shut down. And vice versa, when we open, our natural communication system is hooked in. And we have this rich play of experience that allows us to to actually move fluidly with these kind of real-time updates through complex situations. Now, let's be clear about this. Being in the green light is not pain-free. In fact, actually, if you're in the green light, if you're mindful, you feel pain. And why do you feel pain? Well, because it's important. It's extremely important to feel pain. You know, we have nerves for a reason. When you cut yourself, you want to know that you've cut yourself. When you burned yourself, you want to know that you've burned yourself. That is crucial. I think of a story I heard when I was a child. And uh, it was a fellow I knew who used to work as a logger cutting down trees in the forest. And one of his fellow loggers had a, an accident where he lost sensation in one of his legs. So all the way down the whole leg, he had no sensation. So one morning he put on his boots and he headed out to work and he worked a whole day. And when he came home and he took off his boot, blood poured out. And what had happened is his three-year-old had put a spoon into his boot and he had walked all day on top of that spoon and cut his foot up just horribly. It, it, I, it, when I even think about that story, it just, ugh, I can just feel it. Right? And, it, and that's the thing is that we are, we are like that. Mindfulness keeps us connected so that we don't walk all day on that spoon. And the truth is that a lot of us, having trained ourselves to be mindless in various ways, might actually do something similar to that, that has real consequences. And not just for us. It's not just that 
you know, I harm myself, it also disconnects me from the world. So the relationships I have are not as vivid. They don't go as deep. We actually can't feel as much in the connection. And so we miss cues. And this is in terms of your work professionally. This is, you know, this is how things go astray. Is because we're not actually getting the updates live. Maybe we go into our head. We say, okay, this is like that one case I read about. And now we have a, which is, which is fine. Unto itself is really good, actually. It's nice. That's open mind. But the, the red light version of that is to focus more on my idea of what's going on than the actual relationship. And that's really problematic. So the question here is actually how to come back down into ourself how to kind of reassociate, you know, re-embody, come back to our somatic experience, come back to our emotional intelligence, come back to that clear, curious mind that can ask the right question and put all of that together. And I want to talk a little bit about the intermediate state. So the, ye the yellow light in some ways is the most Let's just say it's, it's one of the most useful places to work. The yellow light is actually the state where we start to shut down or vice versa. It could be the state where we start to open up. It goes both ways. So here, <clears throat> this particularly has to do with anxiety has to do with uh, anxiety, confusion, and you know, oftentimes has to do with a sh kind of a shock, something that happens that you were not expecting in the conversation, in the room, in your body, whatever. And then a, a kind of brutal tendency we have to take that shock, which is normal. Shock is normal. Shock and alarm, that's actually, it could be the green light. But to take it and turn it back on ourself and to become very harsh with ourself. And so this is the moment, I always point to this moment. This is the moment where you hit your toenail on the table. I did this recently. Got a big bruise on my toe because of this. You kick the table leg by accident Oh, there's that shock of pain. And then you say out loud, oh, I'm so stupid. And this is really, I mean, when you really dissect this moment, and think of how normal this is, right? You drop a cup, right? Or, you, oh, you forgot to send the email. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. To then turn back, I mean, that's a painful moment. I'll tell you that the, the foot was a painful moment. But to, but, but to then turn back and castigate ourselves, we really have to examine how that happens and to recognize that that's a trained response. That is not our natural response. That's a trained response. And uh, we won't get into all the details of that trained response today. But suffice it to say that it's a very, on the one hand, it's a very dangerous moment because that self brutality is so painful that one of the things, one of the tendencies we have in that moment is to start pulling the plugs out and to actually dissociate, right? to leave the situation. Now, a lot of the ways that we do that have to do with tuning out. They could also have to do with pushing that kind of pain outward onto an external focus. So the external focus could be um, hatred towards somebody else. 
you know, God, it was that idiot Philip who put that table there in the first place. You know, it's idiots like that. It's not, I'm not an idiot. Now I'm going to push that word idiot onto somebody else. Um, it could also be, ironically, it could actually be, um, I, could, I could push that energy out onto an object of, of uh, clinging. You know, that, you know, maybe Philip did put the table there. And actually, maybe he's put it there a bunch of times. I keep asking him not to. And uh, I've hit my foot on it multiple times. But I feel desperate to stay connected to Philip. So I'll do anything. So actually, instead, I will, I will feel the pain. I'll feel the irritation. Maybe let's, let's call it anger, natural anger. I've asked him like six times not to put the table there. You know, right between my bedroom and the bathroom where the lights are off in the middle of the night. Like it's, you know, this is, come on, don't put the table there. But my desperation to stay connected to Philip, which is another, it's kind of another way of dissociating, another flavor of dissociation, is going to cause me to bury this whole conversation. I won't bring it up. I'm sure he meant well. You know, he's just trying to clean up around here. And, and, you know, I'm sure I probably should just say it for the ninth time. And I'm sure next time he'll get it. That becomes the mode of dissociation. And there's, there's a variety of flavors of this. Arrogance, going into kind of a puffed up arrogant state. You know, going into a kind of strategizing winner take all state. And... Um, and this is happening because of the yellow light. That's the thing, is when we're in this liminal intermediate state of self-aggression, it's before it even goes outward, that moment of self-aggression, that can be worked with. This is exactly, frankly, why your clients come to you. They come to you because they want somebody to actually hold them in that experience with warmth, with acceptance, with curiosity, and to let them go through that process without echoing back to them that harshness. You know, that's a, that's a really beautiful moment. You know, when, you, when I'm saying, oh, I'm such an idiot, but I'm with somebody who says, well, ouch, that hurt. How are you doing? How's your foot? You say, God, I'm so dumb. Why did I do that? And then somebody else says, well, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in you. How are you doing? My God, let me get you some ice for that. Right? It, it helps to cut it helps to cut that cycle, that vicious cycle. <clears throat> so I think that's enough about the three lights today. And there's so much more to say about these three lights. And, and I want to say, you know, I, I'll never forget when I first heard the three lights. And I thought... Yeah, maybe that's too simple. Maybe that's that's a little too simple. You know, here I'd spent all this time around very sophisticated people, presenting very sophisticated theoretical models. And uh, I have to say, years into this, that simplicity is the strength. It is the strength. Now, why is that? Is because when I am in that yellow light state of self-attack, oh, the pain of that is so intense. I cannot get to all those really complicated theoretical models. I just can't. Maybe later. And, and there's nothing wrong with them. It's not like this is a better system or something, right? But it's just this is an applicable system in that state, and that state is crucial. So I want to say that. 
there's actually something very powerful in this because it's simplistic. You know, you literally can teach this to children. I've, I've taught it to children and they listen and that's helpful. That's helpful for, for us with our clients in real time. You know, when somebody challenges you and you're shocked, you thought you had a strong connection and then now you're not sure and you start to attack yourself. Woof, that's the yellow light. So then we need to know what to do. How do we actually support that experience, even at, you know, obviously outside of your session with your client, to, to work with it so that it doesn't tighten up and shut down further? And I also want to say, you know, that, boy, um, you know, you, a lot of you have master's degrees and, you know, you wrote theses on, on topics, very, you know, complex topics. And, and you, know, you know, you might just feel like, well, I do all this anyways. I really do all this anyways with my clients. I can, I can, I can assess all of this on the fly. And I wanted to say, if that's true, congratulations. Like you, you've graduated, you know, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, you know, it, that's no problem. Hooray. Uh, so, so that could be the case. For the rest of us though, if we're honest, we actually do get really challenged by what happens in sessions with our clients. We actually really do feel, at times, like we don't know what's going on anymore. And we do feel that, that harsh self-attack, or we see it with our clients and we're not sure what to do. And, or we try a particular method, it doesn't seem like it's bearing fruit. So this is actually helpful to us. It, it really is, is quite helpful, as basic as it seems. And I wanted to say that it's, uh, you know, it's not as basic as it seems in the sense that um, there is so much to say. This is the tiniest, tiniest tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. And for those of us who study these three lights alone, you can spend years actually really getting into the weeds of what exactly is the yellow light versus a red light. And what is being open with intense emotion versus starting to shut down with intense emotion. So there's, there's a lot more to say about all of this. Um, and in the next video in our series, we're actually going to, we're going to get into how to steer. Once we've understood these three lights a little bit, the five communication superpowers, which you notice I haven't even talked about yet, are going to give us more tools for steering through complex situations and uh, particularly how to build an environment where communication thrives, where disconnection is properly assessed and addressed, and uh, where that yellow light state of self-attack is, is supported in the way that allows it to naturally open up again. So we'll get into all of that in the next class. Um, right now, uh, well, if, you, if you're watching this recording, just please go ahead and share and click like. And uh, also, you know, let us know in your comments. What, what is it like to actually be truly present in communication that triggers you? You know, we're not talking about the easy stuff. We're talking about the communication that really hits your buttons. Specifically, what is it like to be present in the midst of that? Can we be present in the midst of that? And uh, I want to say that, you know, starting to announce, starting on October 5th, we're going to have an eight-month advanced certification in mindful communication. And um, I'm going to do, there's an application, there should be a link hopefully attached to this video versus the last video. And uh, 
And I will, I'm also going to do interviews with professionals who are interested in taking the course based on these webinars. So these webinars will serve as a kind of prerequisite for professionals, experienced uh, mindfulness meditators who want to go deep into this material. We'll actually spend a month on each of these five superpowers and learn a, a, a lot more about each one. So come to the next webinar. We'll have a special gift for you with regard to that course. And I also want to say um, that this is the last year. This, this, this program is priced at $19.95, this eight-month course. It's the last year it's going to be at that price. We're going to up that by 50% next year. And, and if you're in an economy where that's not a viable price, please be in contact with us and we'll, we will work with you. We really appreciate people from, from all sorts of cultures who, you know, where the economy might be affected to the degree that you can't pay that price. We'll, we'll figure something out. Okay, leave any comments or questions. We'll take a look at those and I will hopefully see you on Wednesday. And uh, thanks for your patience through all the technical issues. I uh, hope you get some um, value out of this uh, session today. Take care.